you look at the spiral bound three ring punch mail. Six seventy one. Six seventy one. We're gonna do our this is our last lab where we're actually learning something. In theory. Although you can argue you don't learn anything ever. In the upper right corner, there should be a little box, a little table. If you don't have one, just buddy up with somebody. So this is called cocktail party genetics. So you're supposed to remember everything you learn in 112 about doing a genetics problem. Yeah, so that's the usual response I hear. Um, so what you're supposed to be able to do is figure out a phenotype and a genotype for yourself and or a hypothetical patient. And that's what lab, what is it, 45 is doing. So to help you do that, we're going to do some cocktail party stuff you can see in people. So the very first box you see in the top of 671 says PTC taster. On your desk, you should have a little piece of tissue paper I gave you. That's okay. So this paper is coated with a chemical. Special paper. And this chemical binds to a receptor on your tongue, and if you have that receptor, you'll taste it. If you don't have a receptor, you will not taste it. That's genetically determined. So the trick is, if you have the genes, you will taste the paper. If you are not carrying the genes, it means you're recessive, you will not taste the paper. I am recessive. I do not know what this tastes like. I can suck on this all day long. All it does is taste like a napkin. But if you have a receptor, if you're dominant, you'll have a receptor, you put in your mouth, and you will taste something. So your job now is to put that paper in your mouth. If you taste something other than just a wet napkin, you are a winner genetically. So put it in there, and you will know quickly by your face, we have a taster. Yes. Okay, it tastes like shit. That's what we heard. All right. I do not know that because I can't taste it. <laughs> oh, no, I tasted. Taste the real stuff, not this, right? I have no idea. Come on. Come on. It just tastes like wet paper that you didn't taste anything. It tastes like something. So you're probably not a taster. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Good. Is there a taster in? I don't know what taste is. Sure. All right, so after that experience, if you tasted something other than paper, you're going to be a taster. So in the little box, you're supposed to write down a phenotype and a genotype. Remind me from 112 what a phenotype was. A physical part. Physical part, describing yourself. So you're a taster or you're not a taster, or I gagged or I didn't, right? So in the phenotype box, you're writing down a description of what you are. Short, fat, tall, whatever. So I'm a non-taster, because I can't taste the paper. That's my phenotype. You're gonna write something. For genotype, what was the genotype from my The gene part. The gene, the letters. So tasting is dominant. So give me letters to represent a taster's genotype. Capital P. Capital P. All right. So if you're a taster, you could be either homozygous, meaning two bigs, right? Or you could be heterozygous, meaning a big and a little. Both those people would look tasty. I can't wrong. Right? It'd be taster phenotypes, right? Or big. It doesn't matter what letter you pick, right? Like A's, B's, C's, whatever. Just whatever. Now, I'm a non-taster, so what's my genotype going to be? Lower P. Homozygous recessive or little p, little p. Because I can't taste, I don't have the gene, the dominant allele. right? So you have two alleles per genotype, and the combination says what you are. 
So that's the goal for your lab practical is that when you're given things like phenotype, genotype, homozygous, heterozygous, you remember from 112 what that terminology means. We have to do a punishment. Well, you will have to do a punishment. Uh, or you could, you're you supposed to know how to do a punishment. Does one example make a difference versus two? No. And what if it came later on in life? Is that just, does that sometimes happen? That just happens. But it's still genetically informal. But, but that's still genetic. Why yep. Came yep. So the next box says something about sodium benzoate. Another paper with a different taste. I again cannot taste this. I'm double recessive. I cannot taste it. I do not know what this is. It's a different chemical, a different gene, so you might taste one and not taste the other, but I only know from the kind of smell what I think it might taste like. Which is usually more of a than everyone else does. This is sodium benzoate. It's like a nail file, right? I don't know if the nail file is like that. Nobody feels in the file. Yes. 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 So a lot of your foods have these mixtures of these chemicals, and so that's why different foods taste different people. You can't taste like some people. You can't taste like some people. You can't taste like Okay, so like before, you're going to write down a phenotype, how, describe yourself, taster, non-taster, and then give yourself letters to match your genotype. So tasting was dominant, not tasting is recessive. And I am a homozygous recessive. I don't taste anything when it puts stuff in my teeth. Yes, I can. Uh, I can. Wait, are we doing all three of the little slabs? No, surface enemy is not part of this. Is this a recession? Dominant. These are dumb. Tasting's dominant. Okay, the next one says sex. That's not a yes, no, right? That is genetically, are you male or female? So double X, the X, Y. Just write down your phenotype, you know, and then write down the letters that correspond. So that's not a dominant recessive so much as just an X, 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 Y. Which one? <laughs> Tasting's dominant. So big something. That's right. Dominant people look the same no matter if they're heterozygous or homozygous because the dominant takes over. That's right. Flashback, right? Okay, dimples. That's if you smile, you get the little, you know, those things. I don't have them, right? But if you smile and get a dimple, that's dominant. So dimples are dominant. I don't have a dimple. No, that's just a worry spare. That's not a dimple. That's a dimple. She has dimples. <laughs> dimples are dominant. I do not. I'm a biologist. I do not have dimples. So give yourself letters, new genotypes, and all that. No. Okay, widow's peak. That's the V in the front. If you pull your hair back, if it comes into a V, that's a widow's peak. That's dominant. So see if you have a widow. If you're an arm widow. Widow's Peak. Did you? Right? You can still see it. 
that's what they seem to be. Yeah. 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 Should be freckles. Oh, proximal finger. Okay, this is a weird one. So you're looking at the the knuckles of your hand. You're looking at the proximal phalange. Remember that terminology? So down here. If you have hairs on your proximal phalange, that's dominant. That's also called the werewolf sign, right? If you're missing hair, that's actually recessive. That you don't become a werewolf. So werewolves are dominant, meaning you have hair on your proximal phalange. If you don't, you never will get hair in proximal flange. So believe it or not, werewolf sign is dominant, no hair is recessive. They used to call it the werewolf sign. They believe werewolf was indicative of that. It's like Widow's Peak was indicative of being a widow. There's all these phrasing. All of them have like these commonalities. Okay, what are we up to now? We're up to freckles. Okay, this is the pippy long stocking in the sun on your face kind of freckle, not spots other places. But if you go in the sun and you get the freckles around your nose, that's a yes, that's dominant. If you do not do that, it's recessive, you never will. Well, like the classic redhead freckle. Right? On your face in the sun, be long stocking redhead tilted freckle. Dominant. Dominant. Right. So, in your sun on your face. That's the only time these these ones. There's other ones for those. Yeah. So blaze is a white streak in your hair that's a different color, normally, naturally, right? That's dominant. So if you have a blaze, a little stripe of usually blonde or light color in your hair, that's dominant. If you don't, you never will. Yeah. That's a little different. It's actually a spot. If you see them with blaze, they'll be like dark hair and they'll have like a blonde streak, but it's natural. Yeah, one little spot. A little white spot, but it's only what it is is one dermatome does not produce melanin, so you end up with a spot of hair that doesn't actually produce any color. When you get all, all the melanocytes turn off, so that's why all your hair breaks out. But it blazes it through. And then blood type, you can remember from blood lab what your blood type is and assign phenotypes and genotypes. But those are some cocktail trivia. You, can, you did it from lab back then. You can use I's or the A's. That's fine. They're codominants. Yes. But you can add the RH. The RH is, a, RH is a completely dominant allele. So positive is dominant. Negative is recessive. And the ABO system is incomplete dominant. So you can end up with an incomplete and a dominant recessive combination. Incomplete dominance. So AB is AB. Yes, from 112. You did the whole lab on that with me. You should remember that. Right, yes. Oh. O would just be two little I's or just O's. The count is recessive. So O is recessive, the other letters are dominant. It's dominant. So we'll do me. Uh, we're up here. We'll do a putt of square with me. Right. Let's see. So I am B negative. Okay, so if I'm B phenotype, what are, what's my genotype? Um, Ooh, no remember, right? I, 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 yeah, totally. Okay, I can be B B or B O because O is recessive, and any B would be, would dominate, right? So that counts for my B. Negative means I'm recessive. So recessive means I have two little r's. So my genotype, hard to write it out, could be this or that. I have a dominant B making me B. 
I could have a B or an O for my second letter, and then I'm recessive because I'm negative, so therefore I have two little R's. So that is know. actually my genotype for my blood type. And that would be the R type, is the R. You can put an I in some of the O's. You can use I. So if I did the I terminology, I would be this. I could be this, or I could be this. I can use a little, the I's and superscripts, or I can use letters, either way. So B negative is the phenotype. Yes. B negative is my phenotype, and these are the letters representing my genotype. And then if you were positive? If I was positive, then one of these R's becomes a capital something, because R is positive. So it could be big R, big R, or big R, little R. Uh, okay. I know. <laughs> What, oh. what is, wait, before you write that, you have oh, so I, B, and a what? Little I. Little I. It's O. Oh, it's so let's cross, let's cross me with somebody. <laughs> Since you're all concerned about that. Let's do this way, right? Here I am, right? Let's cross me with somebody. Okay, so I am, what phenotype am I again? B negative. I'm B negative. Okay, this person has all A's and all capital R's. So they are A what? Positive. A positive. Because they have dominant A, they have the R. So I'm going to make me some sperm and A. So what sperm can I make? B, B, R, and O, R. Very good, because remember, meiosis does half of each combination thereof. So I can have B with R's and O with R's in my sperm, right? Via meiosis. What kind of eggs can this woman make? A -R. Only an A with an R, because it's the only combination of A's and R's. Punnett square says put them together. So we'll do that. So put her up here. Put me over here. Blah, 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 blah. Sex makes babies. It would be this, right? So I do every combination thereof. So our kids would be, what's this person? A, B, R, or little R? A B positive. positive, and this person is A positive. A positive because the O is recessive, doesn't count, the little r doesn't count. It's A positive, A B positive. We have children from that meeting. Right? Makes sense? So when you're doing your put of squares, you take meiosis, you do half of each combination, and put them in a box, and run the box out to get the same number of letters you started with. So if you can do that with all these things, then you understand how to do your genetics problem. So take your phenotypes. Your genotypes, and then I'm going to mate with somebody who is not a widow's peak. Blah blah blah. You're able to crank out phenotypes and genotypes. So that's what you did in 112 for three weeks of your time. So is that wrong with first generation? Can you do one? Yeah. So this would be F1, be these ones, these are P1s, then their kids would be F2s. Can you do one that's not one? Sure. Pick one. Do one. Okay, widow's peak. Widow's peak. All right. So I'm not a widow. So I'm a non-widow times a widow. Let's do that one. Okay, I'm a non-widow, so I am what? Genotypically. Let's do let's, not do W's, I hate W's. Let's do uh, let's do some nice big letter, like A's. W's are hard to see, right? So I'm gonna be non-widow recessive. A widowed person, I'm gonna make them a heterozygous widowed person. So therefore their genotype is a little A. Right? So meiosis says you get half the letters from each one. So that person has two choices. I have one. Put them in the box. Right? So half the kids are widowed, half are not. 50 50 genotypic ratio. Right? So then you go through and change them around. Let's say I was a widowed person. Also heterozygous, right? That would make then I have two choices here, which adds another row here. And I would have this number. That's the three to one you remember from biology 112. Is I have a duck dominant, homozygous dominant, two heterozygous, all three of them look widowed, and then there's the homozygous recessive does not. So if you can do a simple judge problem like that kind of thing, where you're just cranking out boxes saying three to one, half out. That's the kind of So this is three to one phenotypic ratio. Three widows to one non-widow. Or three quarters, one quarter. But the genotypic ratio. And the one before was 50-50 phenotypic genotypic. 
Two two. Two two one one fifty fifty half half. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's the uh, right. ratio. Right. And half half okay. This one, this one's fifty fifty as well for genotype. Okay. This one here was one to two to one. So twenty five percent this genotype, fifty percent that genotype. One two one. One two one or twenty five fifty twenty five. Mm -hmm. Okay, on the genotype style stuff. So just do a review of one. Go through that last lab there and see if you can do those same problems. But the other stuff you're supposed to know is on pregnancy. There's only two models you have to know for your lab exam next week. About three. This box. You need to take a picture of with your phone. It's all fall off. But you're supposed to be able to look at these pictures and find what's going on. So hey, here's a fertilized egg. Hey, this is doing what? Cleaving. Mitosis or cleavage, right? Oral elastasis, endoderm, ectoderm, mesoderm, all that stuff you learned in lecture is basically on these pictures. So you need to go through that lab and find, you know, yolk sac, endoderm. The thing that's going to freak you out, the yolk sac is red. They colored it funny. So the red thing is the yolk. It would be yellow in every other picture in your life, but they did it red. I don't know why, it's only $800. Right? But you're supposed to be able to find the pictures on that. And then the other model you're supposed to know is this one, which is a placenta, which we'll talk about today in lecture. But this represents placenta. Baby's up here. Mom is down here. And this is the junction between baby and mom. So you're looking at how the baby and mom exchange gases and whatnot on the placenta. Which makes sense. So they have this model. You have this model. And then basically, you got kind of part of this model. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the uterus, right? What's that thing in there? Placenta. So that's the fetal placenta, the one that the baby made. If you rip that off, you see the maternal side, which is on the uterine side. But this one shows the maternal placenta. And then if you open, hi, it's okay. <laughs> if you look at the belly button, hi, belly button. There's a belly button in there. It's also on that model. You're supposed to know how many arteries and veins are in an umbilical cord. So does anyone know how many arteries and veins are in the So if you look at the colors here, there are two arteries and one vein. The thing that's going to throw you off is the coloring. The arteries are blue, the vein is red. Why might that be? Oxygenated. So mom is breathing for you. So the blood going to mom is blue. It's going away from baby, so it's an artery. Mom makes it red. It comes back to baby, therefore it's a vein. So it's that pulmonary thing, where it's the direction, not the color. If you look in here, you're going to have two blues going to mom and one red coming back. So that's the umbilical arteries to one umbilical vein. The vein's also bigger. Right? But that's the other thing that catches people. So you have this model kind of in that one with the baby. You have the placenta. You have the box of basic parts. And that's one of the new models for this week. And you have the genetics problems. That basically completes your lab experience for this term. Then on uh, next week, you have what? Your lab exam on everything from your analysis on through. So all the reproductive stuff still out. That's the major of it would just be porn parts over and over again. Make sense? There'll be some genetics problems. There'll be some UA analysis and some of the slides again. But most of it's going to be plastic models like your first exam was. Then after that, your lab is done. So by that, tomorrow at lecture time, you'll have your lab exams on N-grade. And then you should know your lab grade by then. It's all up to the lecture final after that. Yay. Still have one more week to break it. That's okay. All right, make sense? So use your time as wisely as you can.